<laughs> He's normally very responsive. So maybe I should double check and make sure I really hit send. If only we had some other way to contact Paul. <laughs> All right. Well, it is time. So um, we're very fortunate today to have Ash Clerk as our speaker. Ash is a professor at the University of Chicago, and his research lies at the intersection of condensed matter theory, quantum optics, and quantum information. He's particularly known as a pioneer of the field of quantum optomechanics, um, and I have a I personally have a fondness for his review article on quantum noise, which is one of the most useful papers I read in graduate school. Um, so uh, Ash got his undergraduate degrees in math and physics at the University of Toronto, um, went on to do a PhD at Cornell, postdoctoral work at Yale, and then um, spent over 10 years on the faculty at McGill um, until 2017, when he joined the University of Chicago. Throughout this um, career, he's really established a track record as a theorist who develops uh, deep and creative ideas that have a direct impact on experiments. And so I think we're looking forward to hearing about more ideas of that kind today. Um, before I um, hand it over to Ash, I'll just mention um, he has a um, long list of awards. I won't read all of them. I'll just mention um, two. He um, received the Rutherford Medal of the Royal Society of Canada in 2015. And um, just this year, he was named a Simons investigator in theoretical physics. So um, with that, I'll just briefly mention, hopefully, if you're a regular listener of our seminar, you know that you can um, ask questions at any time in, in the Q&A. And we particularly always um, appreciate questions from um, students and postdocs. And um, Ash will pause for questions over the course of the talk. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Ash to tell us about driven dissipative quantum systems and hidden time reversal symmetries. Great. So thanks so much, Monica, for the uh, perhaps overly kind introduction. Thanks to all the organizers um, for the invitation to speak. Also for running this seminar series. I think it's been an incredible success. It's such a valuable resource to the whole community. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, so the title of this talk might seem a little daunting at first glance, Driven Dissipative Quantum Systems and Hidden Time Reversal Symmetries. I hope to give you what is a gentle introduction to a set of ideas, theoretical ideas, that my group has been really excited about over the past few years. It's trying to approach non-trivial driven dissipative systems, systems where interactions and nonlinearity are strong, and find ways to solve them, to describe them exactly. So not doing perturbation theory, not doing mean field theory, not doing the kind of approximations we normally like to make as theorists. And so the first class of systems I'll really focus on are a kind of ubiquitous driven dissipative uh, system you find all over the place in quantum optics, in, uh, in superconducting circuits, quantum information. It's basically driven dissipative, nonlinear bosonic mode. So think of a driven nonlinear photonic cavity, think of a driven superconducting circuit, I'll tell you about a way of describing these systems exactly, right, without approximations. And what I hope to convince you is this will not just be an exercise in special functions. We'll actually get some physical insight from these exact solutions. We'll learn about phenomena, experimentally accessible phenomena that was previously unknown in these systems. And then in the second part of the talk, I'll kind of step back and ask the question, why is it we can find these exact solutions when there's no small parameter. Is there some secret sauce that makes these systems solvable? And what I'll try to convince you is there is something, it's a kind of symmetry, it's a subtle symmetry, which is why I call it a hidden time reversal symmetry. And on some level, this goes back to something that you probably saw in a stat met class in a classical context many, many years ago, the idea of detailed balance in a classical system, sometimes something you don't hear about too much in a quantum context. I'll try to tell you there's a useful quantum formulation of detailed balance that I prefer to describe as hidden time reversal symmetry that makes these exact solutions possible. So that's the plan. We'll see how far we get. I will definitely allow time for questions. I want to start by acknowledging the people who really did the work. And so both these stories I'll tell you were really led by a graduate student in my group, David Roberts. And the second story, this sort of quantum version of detailed balance, a new PhD student in my group, Andrew Lingenfelder, has made some really nice contributions. 
All right, so let's launch right into it and let's start with a, a sort of you know big picture introduction. So my group, other groups, actually many, many different subfields of physics are interested in trying to make sense of this cartoon here, right? Trying to understand what sort of new phenomena do we get in driven dissipative quantum systems that are not in thermal equilibrium. So what are the elements of this, this little PowerPoint cartoon? We have some systems, so maybe it's some set of, of particles that are interacting in some way. They have a Hamiltonian, that Hamiltonian could be non-trivial, right? My particles are interacting strongly. We're gonna make things more complicated by driving the system. So drive could mean the Hamiltonian is time dependent. It could mean that there is dynamics that basically adds and removes particles or excitations from my system. And then we're gonna be interested in balancing that driving by coupling to dissipation to some external reservoir where crudely speaking, energy can leak out and maybe fluctuations, both thermal and quantum can enter. So this is a pretty simple cartoon, but a complicated mix of phenomena. The question is, how do we think about the steady states of this mix of ingredients? What sort of interesting things uh, can actually happen? And let's be greedier, can we actually describe this kind of physics without having to make the usual approximations? Can I understand this interplay, even if the interactions aren't weak enough to do perturbation theory, even if I'm not close to some mean field limit or some high temperature limit? And at first glance, that seems like a really tall order, right? But we know for non-driven systems, for closed systems with strong interactions, there's a whole class of systems where you can find exact solutions despite the lack of any obvious small parameter. So this is the area of integrable quantum systems, the use of beta Anzac's methods. These are incredibly powerful for a whole set of non-dissipative interacting systems. Is there something analogous in this driven dissipative context? And sort of spoiler alert, I am not gonna be telling you about beta ansatz for driven dissipative systems, right? I'll tell you about something that in some sort of spiritual way is similar, a kind of surprising hidden symmetry that still makes strongly interacting problems kind of solvable. So let's think about uh, almost one of the simplest yet still non-trivial settings where we have all of these ingredients. And so what have I described here with this Hamiltonian? We just have a single bosonic mode. So think of it as a, a single mode of some photonic resonator or a harmonic oscillator. It has a frequency and A here is the photon lowering operator. It has a nonlinearity U, so a care type nonlinearity, a chi three type nonlinearity. And then here's our driving. So we have terms that can add and remove one photon at a time. So an ordinary linear drive. And then we have this slightly more exotic drive, oops a two photon drive or a parametric drive, okay? So I'm gonna make things even a little bit simpler, right? I'm gonna assume that both of these driving frequencies are commensurate. So they're both detuned from this cavity resonance by the same amount. So I can go into a rotating frame where I get rid of the time dependence. Okay, the driving is still there. It's still doing something non-trivial. It gives me these terms that lead to the non-conservation of particle number. Okay, so now we have the, the Hamiltonian with an interaction, we have driving. We also need some dissipation. In this talk, I'm just gonna assume that the, the simplest kind of description of dissipation in the quantum setting is perfectly fine for our system. So I'm gonna describe the dynamics of my system through its reduced density matrix. And I'm gonna describe it with the Lindblad form master equation. So a Markovian equation that's sort of local in time I have the Hamiltonian evolution, just the usual Schrodinger equation. And then I'm going to include terms, these dissipative super operators that just describe different ways photons can leak out of this resonator. So we have a usual single photon loss term. And then what the hell, let's use, include a more exotic two photon loss term. Okay, so in this talk, I am not going to worry about is this actually a good description for a particular microscopic system? I'm gonna take this as a starting point and consider this model in its full generality, not assume the interactions are weak or the driving is weak and ask, what can I say about the steady state of this system? And I won't dwell on it, but I just wanna emphasize, of course, this kind of basic model can be realized in all sorts of experimental settings. Again, nonlinear photonic resonators. A favorite example for me are superconducting circuits. 
right? So in a superconducting circuit, and here's a recent example from Michelle Deveray's group, your cavity mode is some gigahertz frequency microwave mode. The nonlinearity and these funny driving terms, you can get all of that by incorporating superconducting Josephson junctions into your circuit. So this kind of basic Hamiltonian really is applicable and relevant to a number of different experiments. Okay, so what do we want? We want the exact solution. So for those of you who you know, know your quantum optics history, it seems like I'm asking a question that was answered 40 years ago, right? So if you go back to the you know, early days of quantum optics, there is a set of exact solutions of systems like this, work from Drummond and Drummond and Walls, where you can basically analytically describe the steady state with all of these ingredients. So what do these solutions look like? Well, this is what these solutions look like. So this is this steady state density matrix. P and Q are labeling Fox state, so they're integers. So this is telling me the matrix elements of that density matrix. And you see an infinite sum with these funny Fs. These Fs are confluent hypergeometric functions. So they're also infinite sums. So what do we have? We have a exact solution, right? And it's sort of maybe beautiful to look at. What on earth do you do with that? So it's kind of a tour de force that this solution exists, but for most of us directly getting some physical intuition from that, that's a tall order. So what we want to do is something maybe even more demanding. We want exact solutions that actually directly lend themselves to physical intuition. Okay, simply writing down a whole bunch of exact solutions is not going to be good enough. I want to be able to easily use the exact solutions to give me something more. And maybe more than that, why do these solutions exist, right? Even though there's no small parameter or obvious symmetry, if we could identify that, maybe there are other things we can also solve. Okay, so that's the, the general goal of the work I'm gonna be telling you about. Okay, and again, why do we want to even have these solutions, right? What is it we want to hopefully see in the steady state? What would make a steady state interesting versus boring? Let me just highlight two things, things that maybe many of you already know about. The first is the idea of photon blockade. So if I had my cavity mode and I had no nonlinearity at all, and the only driving I had was a linear drive, well, then the steady state is gonna be boring. It's just gonna be a coherent state. So wouldn't it be nice if a simple linear drive could give me something more exotic, something like a Fox state. And with a strong enough nonlinearity with this U, you get the phenomena of photon blockade. So now the energy spacing of these Fox states is not regular, right? The U sort of gives you nonlinearity in those energy differences. So now if the U is strong enough, you can imagine a situation where your linear drive is resonant for that transition, but detuned for that transition. So that's photon blockade. That would be a great way to generate Fox states. We like Fox states. They're non-Gaussian, they're non-classical. What's the problem? you need this U to be much bigger than the loss rates in your system, right? Otherwise, just the broadening of these levels washes out this effect. So wouldn't it be nice if you could get photon blockade, true photon blockade, without needing strong nonlinearity, right? So maybe our exact solutions will shed some light into that. The other thing that's sort of nice, and I think you already heard about a little bit uh, a few weeks ago in the talk from Liang Jiang, is the idea of quantum bistability. So what you're looking at here is a curve that hopefully is familiar looking. This is just the classical resonance curve of a nonlinear oscillator. So what's the amplitude as a function of the detuning of the drive? You see there are some drive frequencies where you can actually have bistability. There are two stable solutions, the classical equations of motion. So usually when you make your system quantum, you lose that bistability. There's only one unique steady state for the density matrix. But in special cases, that's not true. In special cases, you can have what I'm gonna call quantum bistability. So these two different classical amplitudes correspond to two different coherent states. Each of those coherent states is a possible steady state. Superpositions of those can also be steady states, right? And so in Liang's talk, he gave you a beautiful introduction to that's actually a really interesting way of doing error correction using these bosonic modes or sort of microwave cavities. Hey, wouldn't it be nice if there were other ways of getting bistability? 
this quantum bistability, right? And maybe our exact solutions could shed some light into that. Okay, so how are we gonna get these exact solutions? And again, we're gonna be demanding the exact solutions have to be useful, okay? And the starting point for our work actually goes back to a really nice paper from Kai Stanagel, Peter Rabo, and Peter Zoller, where they looked at the simplest version of this problem, where the only nonlinearity is this on-site care nonlinearity, this Hubbard U. So no nonlinear loss, no nonlinear driving. And again, this is a problem that was solved by Drummond in 1980. They came up with a very nice alternative way of rederiving that solution. Okay, so what's the basic idea? Here is a cartoon of my physical system. There is one photon loss. When a photon leaves, it never comes back. I can model that loss in whatever way I want. So I stress, this is something we're doing at the level of theory. At the level of theory, let's model the one photon loss as a coupling to some fictitious chiral waveguide. Difficult to maybe build in an experiment, easy to describe theoretically. So if the loss was due to a chiral waveguide, I could put anything I want downstream and that's not gonna influence the physical A cavity at all. Okay, so first glance, this seems like a dumb thing. You took a problem that was hard, you added more ingredients to it, we're violating Occam's razor. So why are we doing this? Well, this can be anything, this coupling can be anything. Wouldn't it be nice if I could actually have this entire composite system with two cavities relax into a pure state? So then I'd be trying to find a pure state wave function of this doubled system. If I just trace out the unphysical B cavity, I get the thing I want, the steady state of the A cavity. Okay, is that still, that's a nice thing to ask for. How do you do it? So what this nice paper showed was there's a really simple guess for how you should pick the properties of the B cavity that make this work. Just take the B cavity to have minus the Hamiltonian of the A cavity. And if you do that, you exactly get the physics you want. This entire coupled system relaxes into a steady state. Here's its steady state, pure state wave function. That lets you get this uh, steady state density matrix for cavity A in a nice simple way. This lets you re-derive that Drummond solution. And technically it's a lot, lot easier than the sort of machinery that Drummond used. Okay, so the question we asked was, well, that's really awesome. That's a much nicer way of getting that solution. Is that a fluke? So if I start adding more complicated elements to this problem, does this still work? So let's now add nonlinear driving, right? Uh, let's add nonlinear loss. Hell, let's go crazy. Let's add a weird cubic driving term. So why on earth a dagger, a dagger, a? So you can think of this as single photon addition that depends on the number of photons already in your system. So why on earth would I add that? Well, because I can still solve the problem with that term there. That's not such a great answer. If you had a term like this, you could do something pretty awesome. So I told you it'd be great to have photon blockade with weak nonlinearities. This sort of term, along with an ordinary single photon driving term, would let you do that. Right, so if I had a resonator with this funny thing, ordinary single photon driving, you could imagine a situation where if you start with n naught photons and you wanna to go to n naught plus one, there are two ways of doing it, right? Using either this lambda one or this lambda three term, you could get a perfect destructive interference for that transition, but you wouldn't have a destructive interference for the transitions leading up to that Fox state. So if you could do this, if you could realize this term, you could build a sort of wall in Hilbert space. There'd be some photon number where you just can't go past it because there's effectively no matrix element. This is not sensitive to the value of dissipation, right? Okay, so dissipation does not let you go over this wall, okay? And so this is actually, some of you might know what unconventional photon blockade is. This is very, very different than that. This is really a hard cutoff in the photon number distribution. What I'll try to convince you is this physics is relevant, even if like in most experiments, you have no way of generating that term. Okay, so I don't wanna go through all the machinery of how we actually get these solutions. 
Long story made short, you add all of these ingredients, including this funny lambda three term, some two photon loss, this trick that was first introduced in this paper from Stanogel, Rabel, and uh, Zoller, it still works. So we now have two. So here again is our physical cavity. Here is this fictitious auxiliary cavity. We have two chiral waveguides, one corresponding to single photon loss, one corresponding to two photon loss. The same trick of just taking this auxiliary cavity to have minus the Hamiltonian of the original cavity, that still all works. Okay, so long story made short, well, one of the things we wanted was we didn't just want an exact solution. We wanted a user-friendly exact solution. And that's what we basically get here. So in this problem, real cavity, fake cavity, it's useful to think about some new normal modes. So the sum and difference of the real and the fake cavity. It turns out that the steady state of this whole system, this minus mode is empty. So all you need to do is find the pure state wave function of one of these composite bosonic modes. And there's a really nice way to do that and link it to an exact solution. And this is a piece of physics that I had no idea about. Somehow my student David, I don't know, was up on the mathematical physics literature from the 1960s. So there's a really old piece of mathematical physics, the Siegel-Bargman representation. So a formal correspondent between Fox space and a space of analytic functions. And so the idea is, okay, I've got a state of a harmonic oscillator. I could expand it in Fox states. These are Fox states. These are my expansion coefficients. If I had those coefficients, well, I could use them to construct through this power series expansion, uh, an analytic function of Z. So Z is a complex number. And so what I claim is, okay, no one can stop me from doing this. This is useful for the mathematics to solve this problem. This thing here, is like a wave function in phase space. So Z is complex, X plus IP, right? It's like a probability amplitude in phase space. So what does that mean? That sounds nonsensical. If you take the modulus square, oops, if you take the modulus square of this, this is actually a well-known phase space distribution. Okay, so if I have a density matrix, I could ask about what's the probability I'm in a given coherent state. This is known as the Q function. It's a function of alpha. That is basically this funny Siegel-Bargman wave function, modulus squared up to an exponential factor. So long story short, we wanted a useful analytic solution. The analytic solution will directly give me this object here. That object is useful. It tells me something about what the state looks like in phase space. Okay, so this exact solution has lots and lots of fun properties, lots of things that I think are really amenable to experiment. I am not going to go through a laundry list of all the cool things that come out of this. I'll just sort of give you some highlights. So one of the highlights is, again, the steady state of this problem, it really reduces to understanding a much simpler object. So this impure density matrix that describes this funny driven damped cavity, it's properties are controlled by a pure state wave function of a single mode. Okay, and that's not generically true for any density matrix you could write down. So there's a nice picture of this final steady state. You start with some non-trivial, non-Gaussian, pure single mode state. You effectively send it into a beam splitter. So mix it with the vacuum state. And then you just keep what comes out at one output. So at one output, the stuff here will be entangled with the stuff here. The stuff here will not be in a pure state. That's exactly the steady state wave function you want. Okay, and that little cartoon actually gives you a lot of physical insights. First of all, it tells you whatever the state is of this problem, its Wigner function has to be positive definite. So the Wigner function of this final physical state, it's actually related to this probability density of this funny phi plus state, it's related to its Q function. So there's some really interesting things you can already say about this problem in terms of, is the steady state interesting or not? It's sort of in between those two extremes. Its Wigner function has to be positive definite, even though it's not Gaussian. So that's unfortunate, but it's P function. So another way of looking at this state in phase space can be completely non-singular. Okay, so that's one insight that comes out of this solution. 
Here is, for anyone who wanted to actually see it, what that exact solution looks like. So this wave function in phase space, it's just a single special function. So most of you will not still be too happy or excited about that. What's the real physical content? The physical content is all of these parameters, and let's ignore the lambda three for a moment. They boil down to two dimensionless parameters. Okay, and what are these two dimensionless parameters? There is this R2 parameter, which is basically detuning in units of the interaction. There's this R1 parameter that at first glance looks super bizarre. It involves some weird ratio of the one and the two photon drives, okay? So the thing that I claim, and you'll have to read the paper to get all the details, is when you tune your system such that one or both of these parameters is a positive integer, then you get interesting steady state. So this is sort of like a phase diagram of our model in terms of these two effective parameters. Anytime R1 or R2 is an integer, so there's these horizontal and vertical lines, you either get a novel kind of photon blockade phenomena or a kind of resonance or anti-blockade phenomena. And then what happens if both of them are integers and also R2 is bigger than R1, these are these Xs, those give you new kinds of quantum bistability. So the bistability that people have studied in the system and exploited to great extent, that's this point in this phase diagram. Our work suggests that there's other interesting points of bistability floating around in this phase diagram. So I'm not gonna go through all this and I wanna leave uh, some time for questions. Let me focus on one thing and that is this, uh, this kind of photon blockade effect that occurs when you tune this funny combination of parameters to be an integer, right? So what would you see in an experiment, right? So telling experimentalists about exact solutions, often there's a, you know, an excitement gap. The theorist is really excited. The experimentalist couldn't care less that you exactly solved your model. But what would you see if you were looking for this phenomenon? So what I've plotted here is, imagine in an experiment you have some two photon drive. You don't have this two photon loss. That's hard to do. You have some ordinary loss. You have some care. And you basically let the system reach its steady state, measure the average photon number in this mode. And then you basically repeat the experiment, but you vary the magnitude of that single photon drive. Okay, and so this is what our theory predicts, that when you have special values of the single photon drive, that make this parameter an integer, there's this sudden suppression in the average photon number, okay? And the, the diamonds here are just full on master equation numerics. The solid lines here are from the exact solution. The solid lines do have width. So if I really zoom in on one of these features, so a much more narrow range of these single photon drive amplitudes, um, you have this very, very narrow anti-resonance. Okay, so the first point to make is if you were just doing blind numerics, this would be a hard thing to find, right? Having the analytic solution, we knew this had to be there, right? The second thing is what on earth is going on here, right? And this comes back to this lambda three term. So this data here, right, these results, that's for this Hamiltonian. So no funny lambda three term. So what is happening at one of these special points? Well, at that special point when R1 is tuned to be an integer, if you just do a phase space displacement, your Hamiltonian in that new displaced frame exactly looks like that Hamiltonian with this funny cubic lambda three term. So basically what you're getting is photon blockade due to this wall in Hilbert space in a displaced frame, okay? So I think that's the, the main things I wanted to say about this exact solution. There's many other things that I think are kind of cool. What I wanna do in the, the time that's left is try to tell you why on earth does this work and could we generalize it? But I think this might be a nice time to pause and uh, take questions if there are any. So let me do that. Great, so um, we'll um, start with a general question from Dan Snamper Kern who asks, um, I notice you choose to study a system of bosons is there a sense in which dissipative dynamics is richer or maybe more tractable for bosons rather than fermions? That's an interesting, very, very kind of general question. I think the, uh, 
you know, the answer is it depends, right? Um, I think if everything is sort of linear dynamics, whether it's bosons or fermions, it's equally simple, right? So if I had no nonlinearity, you know, the statistics don't really make one problem much harder than the other. With the nonlinearity, one nice thing you have with bosons is you have a nice semi-classical limit, right? I can think of this in some limit as just some damped nonlinear, you know, classical oscillator, right? And that can give you a lot of insights. In the fermionic case, you don't actually have that. So I have to admit being biased from the kind of experimental systems I've worked on, even though my, my origins involved electrons and quantum transport, we spent a lot more time thinking about um, the bosonic version of these problems. That being said, we now think there's a general way of using these tricks for systems that don't look anything like what I'm showing you here. We're really curious in sort of applying them to non-trivial fermionic problems. Great. So there's a question from um, Manuel Munoz Arias who asks, does this methodology apply um, when you deal with collective spin systems or spin coherent states? Also really interesting question. And I'll tell you a little bit, a bit in what comes next about how to extend this for more general kinds of problems. You know, the simplest answer is if you're talking about a collective spin system where I'm allowed to do Holstein Primakov, that is represent it with bosons, and I'm allowed to truncate the holstein primakov approximation to some you know, order in one over n, well, then that collective spin problem, at least parts of it, just looks like some messy interacting boson problem. If I don't, and then the same kind of machinery holds, if that doesn't hold, what I'll tell you about in just a few minutes is there is a way to extend this machinery to spin problems. Now, we haven't done that for a large n spin ensemble, We've done it for up to two qubits, right? But that's a starting point, it still works. So I think there is hope of applying these ideas to sort of many spin systems. It's, even though we discovered and others have sort of come upon these solutions thinking about bosons, we now think that this physics is not bosonic. And by that, I mean, why can we find these solutions? Great. So we have um, a pair of questions about the photon blockade. So first of all, um, Ivan Deutsch asks, can you explain again how you can get photon blockade without lambda three? Yeah, so let me go. And again, this might be one of these things where someone is gonna accuse me of not defining photon blockade properly. So I'm starting from the point of view, having a Fox state and a displaced Fox state. So if you take that Fox state and you just displace it in phase space, those are equally interesting states because as a theorist, I like to think my experimental friends can do displacement operations, sort of a simple Gaussian operation easily. So what I am arguing here is in the physics I'm describing at these special points, what you actually end up with is a blockaded state in this displaced frame. So take a state that only has population of zero and one and no other Fox states, and then displace it in phase space. That's the state that you're getting from this dynamics. And when you go into the displaced frame, so take this Hamiltonian everywhere you see an A, replace it by A plus uh, alpha, you will generate from this care interaction something that is cubic. And the thing that is cubic is exactly this lambda three term, okay? And in particular, when you tune parameters in this crazy way, the coefficient that relates you know, the lambda three term and the lambda one term, just the ordinary single photon drive, it's an integer. And that gives me this nice property that this thing vanishes when a dagger a is unknown. So it's photon blockade in a displaced frame. I think that's just as interesting, right? But that, that is a key part of this physics. Thanks. So, um... I'll just ask one more question. Um, we have um, Shimon Kolkowitz asks, what determines the width of the blockade resonances? So that's a great question. <laughs> and I have to admit, it's something that people have always asked. And we were kind of, I don't want to say lazy. There were just so many interesting things to do that we didn't focus on that originally. And it was always depressing to say, oh, look, like we have this exact solution. It describes everything. Oh, wow, that's a crazy narrow width. Why is that narrow? Well, we haven't actually worked that out. It's somewhere in that special function. So my student, Andrew, very recently came up with a very nice physical explanation of what's going on. 
And so the idea is when you, you know, so this width, first of all, is much, much narrower than the single photon loss rate. So the smallest scale in the problem you would think would be the damping rate. That's 10 to the minus two in these units. This width is like 10 to the minus five. So it's not the damping rate. So the idea is that when you're at this blockaded state, exactly at the blockade, there's a very, very small dissipative gap in your system. What, what I mean by that is there's some really high amplitude state that semi-classically would be stable. It's not a steady state, but it decays very, very, very slowly. So a really, really slow decay rate, that means there's sort of a, a small gap in the spectrum of my Leovillian that makes you very, very susceptible to small perturbations. Okay, so the idea is when you, you know, when you mess up this blockade by moving the single photon drive amplitude a little bit, you can now get stuck in that high amplitude state, right? And then that messes up your final blockade phenomena. So that sounds depressing, but that steady state phenomena that takes an infinite amount of time for that to happen. These are all steady state results. If you do your experiment in finite time, this feature is a lot more robust. You do not need to have some insane tuning on the single photon drive. But it is, you know, when I first saw this, it seems a reason to be very suspicious of the solution to get a scale on the problem that is so much narrower than kappa one, this uh, you know, damping rate, that was definitely a surprise at first glance. Thanks. So with that, I think we'll um, let you continue and just remind everyone listening to put their questions in the Q&A as you speak, and then we'll um, pause again at the end. Cool. And Monica, just Monica, one question. How much time do I have left? I seem to have uh, not done my... About... Um, you have about um, 20 minutes. Okay, perfect. That's great. Okay, so for this one particular system, you know, kind of ubiquitous system with some interesting ingredients, we have these surprising solutions. And again, the nonlinearity doesn't have to be weak. As long as this master equation is a valid description, I can tell you exactly what the steady state is. So the question is, why does this work? And to give you a hint that maybe this is a bit subtle, well, that crazy lambda three term worked. Maybe if I add another cubic term, it'll also work. So what if I added a term that really adds and removes three photons at a time? Well, then this trick doesn't work anymore. Okay, so it's not as simple as, you know, three A is okay, four A is okay, five A is bad, right? There's something more going on here. Okay, and this is something, this actually goes back even to these solutions from Drummond and sort of coworkers in the eighties. Why do they work, right? Um, and so the idea that we've sort of hit upon is it's actually related to a subtle notion of time reversal symmetry. And we call it hidden time reversal symmetry for a reason. When you think about time reversal symmetry in a dissipative system, even classically, you have to be careful what you mean by that. Okay, so really quick review of things that you probably already know about time reversal symmetry. Classically, we have a symmetry in terms of our equations of motion. If X and P as functions of time solve the equations of motion, and again, I have no external magnetic fields, et cetera, well, then this is also a good solution of the equations of motion, right? So T goes to minus T, also an overall sign and momentum. So quantum mechanically, what you learn in some, you know, graduate class is you can you think about time reversal symmetry in a, in a more abstract way. It's a symmetry of your Hamiltonian, right? To so some operation that leaves H invariant, but it's not generated by a unitary operator. It's generated by an anti-unitary operator. So this is the situation for a closed system, no driving, no dissipation. How do we think about this for a open system? And let's think about that classically first, right? So a natural way to think about a dissipative classical system, an open system, is to think about what I'll call a classical master equation, right? So my system could be in some one of some collection of states. So I'm gonna give those states discrete labels. These could be points in phase space, but let's just keep things simple. So in this example, there are three different states that my system could be in, right? This label I could be one, two, or three. 
And then there's some equation of motion that just tells me there's a probability at every time to be in one of those states and there's transition rates, right? From any given state to any other given state. I could also have a very abstract notion of time reversal here. Time reversal basically takes one of these microstates and maps it to another. The simplest example would be these states are time reversal invariant. So this I tilde, the time reverse version of I is the same thing. Okay, and if you wanted things to be continuous, you could make this a Fokker Planck equation, really the same kind of description. So how do you think about time reversal symmetry? The consequences of time reversal symmetry or reversibility in this context, it's this notion of classical detailed balance. So if you solve this equation for the steady state, in the steady state, there's a balancing of probability fluxes. So this is the probability flux to go from I to some state J. So here's the probability of being an I in the steady state, the transition rate. This is the probability flux for the time reversed version of that, right? So the final state here is J. This is the time reversed version of that. This is sort of the time reversed backwards transition. So this is the standard definition of classical detailed balance. In the simplest case, I tilde is the same as I. It says that in your steady state, there are no probability currents. If your system has detailed balance classically, it's easy to solve the master equation. It's easy to solve the Fokker Planck equation. Okay, another consequence, the last thing you need to know about classical detailed balance, if you have this property, then in the steady state, there's a symmetry of the fluctuations in that steady state. So this sort of time symmetry is often called an Onsager symmetry because it shows up in the derivation of the Onsager reciprocity relations. If I look at a correlation function of two quantities, two things I could measure, it doesn't matter whether I measure A first or B first. Okay, so these are steady state averages. The tildes here mean, okay, maybe I have to time reverse those observables. So if, I don't know, A was momentum, A tilde would be minus momentum. So this is all classical. This is in the last chapter of your favorite stat mech textbook. How do you make this quantum mechanical, right? So this is something that um, people have been thinking about for quite some time. And the problem is, okay, my quantum setting is this equation here. I have more than just probabilities and transition rates. My density matrix has off diagonal elements. So the standard way of thinking about this is this definition is hopeless to generalize. Right? There's too many things in my quantum theory. This definition though, I could just take those classical averages and make them quantum averages. Okay, so this is a definition of quantum detailed balance that goes back to the 70s from people like uh, Agarwal and Carmichael. For our purposes, I'm gonna argue, this is just not interesting or useful. So if I insist my quantum system has this kind of detailed balance, it has to be pretty trivial. So what do I mean by that? The only quantum systems that satisfy this kind of detailed balance, their steady states have to have no coherences between energy eigenstates. So if my Hamiltonian has some energy eigenstates phi n, the only steady states I can have are incoherent mixtures of those states. So you take like the world's simplest driven dissipative quantum problem, a qubit that is driven and subject to loss, it does not satisfy this. So if your goal was to use some notion of quantum detailed balance to understand something non-trivial, this is not gonna give it to you. Okay, so what I'll try to tell you is there's a version of quantum detailed balance that is actually useful. And to do that, let me uh, return to classical detailed balance and present it in an equivalent but more confusing way. Okay, so here's our classical master equation these discrete states, transitions between them. Let's make a doubled version of that. So here's another system that is exactly the same phase space. So the same possible microstates. It has no dynamics at all. So nothing ever changes in system B. System A has exactly the same rates. So now imagine at T equals zero, I start my system off in this kind of classically correlated state, right? So I need to know the probabilities for system A being in state N, system B being in state B, right? That probability is just basically the steady state probability for system A that we got from the system A master equation. And then system B 
is forced to be in the time reversed version of, of this state A. Okay, so system B is sort of some auxiliary object we've introduced. It sort of remembers in a kind of funny way, the initial configuration of system A. Now, if you do this, a completely equivalent definition of classical detailed balance is to look at a symmetry of correlation functions where you measure something in system A and something else in system B. So X is some quantity you can measure, Y is some other quantity. This is completely the same as that simpler definition. It doesn't matter whether you measure X in A or X in B. Okay, so confusing way to reformulate classical detailed balance. Doesn't give you anything new classically, right? The interesting thing is if you now do this quantum mechanically, it actually does give you something new. So quantum mechanically, again, our dynamics are this Limblad master equation, very general now, it doesn't have to be bosons. I could imagine finding the steady state, diagonalizing it. And now I'm gonna construct a doubled system. So whatever my original system was, maybe a cavity, I now have a fictitious cavity. I wanna copy this step, right? Having a correlated state. Well, now I'm gonna construct an entangled state of the original system and this fictitious system. And this entangled state, this is an example of a thermophile doubled state. From the point of view of system A, system A looks the same, right? So these are the same states K that diagonalize system A steady state density matrix. For system B, I kind of do the same thing I did classically. System, if system A is in state K, system B is in the time reversed version of that. Okay, so the idea is that to do this construction, I need to have some notion of what, what's the right T operator? What's the correct definition of time reversal for this system? But now how am I gonna decide, have I found the right T or not? I'm basically gonna generalize this condition here. Okay, so the basic idea, here's my original system. I do this doubled system construction. I have some guess as to what the right definition of T is, right? I now construct this doubled system. Again, system A evolves with the same master equation I started with. System B has no dynamics. It's static. It's just initially correlated with system A. What does it mean to have detailed balance? It's basically, I have the same correlation function symmetry as what I had in the classical case. So I'm gonna define quantum detailed balance or hidden time reversal symmetry. You found a special T if for this doubled system, it doesn't matter whether you measure X on system A or you measure it on system B. So you're always looking at correlations between the two systems, right? There's just a question of where is the T, where is A? Okay, so all of this right now seems a little bit crazy, right? This is just, you can't stop me from defining something, but why would I define something like this? For those of you who know a little bit about the mathematical physics literature on quantum detailed balance, there is an infinite number of definitions of quantum detailed balance. This is just one of them that shows up in the literature. So I claim this is a special one. This is a useful one because it's actually gonna let us get exact solutions of systems. And just to give you an example, so here is the old fashioned version of detailed balance, just insist on a correlation function symmetry looking at your original system. Here is our new fancy, confusing looking definition. This simple problem, a driven damped qubit, it violates this condition. So if you look at just a sigma y, sigma z correlation function for this Rabi driven qubit, that's this blue curve here. It is not symmetric. It satisfies this hidden time reversal symmetry condition. Okay, so, so what? There's some definition that is more general. The thing that we kind of claim in this paper is this definition really lets us do a lot of interesting things. And what I'll focus on in just the last few minutes of the talk is the fact that this helps us answer our original question. Why could we find those exact solutions? What was the, the special sauce? It's the presence of this hidden time reversal symmetry. So what we prove in this paper is there's basically a theorem if your system satisfies this really weird definition of hidden time reversal symmetry, quantum detailed balance, 
That is, there exists a T such that the doubled system has this symmetry. Then this absorber method for getting perfect solutions is guaranteed to work. Okay, and it's true for any Lindblad master equation where you have arbitrary multiple jump operators. So here is my cartoon of an arbitrary Lindblad master equation. The C's are the jump operators. Here's my attempt to sort of use this perfect absorber trick. Each one of those dissipative processes is a coupling to a chiral waveguide. I put some fictitious system downstream. I want the whole thing to relax to a pure state. The question is, what on earth is the Hamiltonian here? How does this auxiliary system couple to those waveguides? So what we prove is, if you have this hidden time reversal symmetry, then this object and these couplings are guaranteed to be simple. If you have hidden time reversal symmetry, the Hamiltonian you need here is just minus the original Hamiltonian. These coupling operators for the fictitious systems, they're basically given here. They're just mixtures of the original jump operators you had. So you here, is some unitary matrix that squares to one. So long story short, maybe you don't like it, but there is a weird symmetry underlying these solutions. It's this deformed version of classical detailed balance. It's a notion of time reversal symmetry that's relevant to dissipative systems that is sort of a little bit hidden, okay? And so let me, uh, you know, maybe I'll kind of end on this. So again, Crazy symmetry lets us find exact solutions. What would you actually measure in an experiment? So I come to you and I tell you, Monica, there's this great system. It has hidden time reversal symmetry. You should really do an experiment. And so if I tell you, you had one hard system, make two of them, prepare it in a thermophile double state, measure those doubled system correlators. Well, maybe in a heroic experiment, you can do that. And there's some nice work from Chris Monroe's group that has really tried to do that. That's a hard thing to do, right? The really amazing thing is there are things to measure that let you sense the presence of this symmetry, even if you don't wanna make two copies of your system, right? So what I told you was if you had 1970s version of quantum detailed balance, all correlation functions have a time symmetry. They're the same for T and minus T. So for our version of hidden time reversal symmetry, it's much more general, that's not true. But what is true is there's always a special class of correlation functions that are guaranteed to be symmetric. So this is an example for this sort of care system. Here's a weird correlation function, a cubed to t a of zero. You do the calculation, this is the real part of that correlation function, that is time symmetric. Okay, if you just pick some other random correlation function, so X and P here are quadratures, we've squared them. There's nothing that guarantees that needs to be symmetric. Okay, so the upshot is this isn't just some, you know, theory playing around. There's a very specific thing you could measure in a wide class of experiments to diagnose the existence of this symmetry. And let's see, I have oh, two minutes, let's say. The one other thing you could worry about is, well, look, let's look at this, um, this Hamiltonian here. If I had a really, really, really high temperature, right? If I didn't just have loss, but I had thermal fluctuations coming from these baths, well, then my system is pretty much gonna be in a thermal state. The drives won't do much. If my system is in thermal equilibrium, even quantum mechanically, it's gonna have detailed balance. So maybe all that's going on here in these systems is, for some bizarre reason, even as you lower the temperature, that classical detailed balance kind of survives all the way down. And I wanna convince you that that's actually not the case, that this kind of detailed balance is sort of a property of quantum fluctuations. It's not just somehow classical physics working all the way down to zero temperature. So one way of diagnosing that is, I said there are special correlation functions that are symmetric in time. If I lose detailed balance, these things are not symmetric in time. So as a kind of order parameter, I can basically ask how asymmetric in time is one of these special correlation functions. So that's what's being plotted here, again, for one of these parametrically driven care resonators. 
now as a function of temperature. So we're including some thermal dissipators. And the kind of cool thing you see is like, there's something that almost looks like a phase transition. So for very, very low temperatures, you have that symmetry. It looks like you have this hidden time reversal symmetry. You go above some kind of critical temperature, that symmetry seems to be gone, okay? So the, the one simple point I wanna make here, this is not just some weird fluke by classical physics, works all the way down to zero temperature. This is really something that's unique to the property of the, of the quantum fluctuations. Okay, so I think uh, I pretty much wanna stop here. I think we're scratching the surface, we hope, of what you can do with these ideas. I've told you about applying them to bosonic systems. They work for qubit systems. We can do more than just a single bosonic mode. We've shown this works for sort of Bose-Hubbard-Dimer type systems. We really think there's a hope of applying these uh, ideas to sort of lattice systems. We even think there's a hope of applying these ideas to systems where you don't have a Lindblad master equation, where the dissipative dynamics is non-Markovian. So let me stop there. Hopefully I've given you a flavor for these ideas, maybe some incentive to sort of take a look at these papers. Maybe I'll end with a, a little bit of sort of shameless advertising. So if this is something that sort of seems interesting to you, my group is certainly looking both for new graduate students and postdocs. So definitely reach out uh, if that might be of interest. So let me flash back to the actual conclusions and I will stop here. Thank you. So thanks Ash for this wonderful talk. Um, we have a couple of questions and um, as we ask those, if there are more, um, I encourage our audience to continue um, typing them in. But um, we'll start with a question from Dima Budker. Um, so he, he asks, um, you can have a steady state driven system that only goes one way. So like from one to two to three to one. Yeah. Um, so there is no um, one to three transition and no detailed balance. Mm -hmm. This does not seem to fit the class of situations that you are describing, correct? Yeah, and so this is almost going, and that's a great point. Like that's almost what you normally think about classically with violating detailed balance. You think about, let's go back to this little cartoon here. You think about steady states where there's definitely a current in the steady state, right? And, and you can think about quantum versions of that. We've done a lot of work on synthetic non-reciprocity. I'm almost interested in something more general here and also a definition that doesn't force me to answer a thorny question. So what is the relevant current? If I wanted to find breaking detailed balance by having a current in the steady state, how exactly should I define that current? So the nice thing about the definitions that I'm talking about, we never have to answer that question. Maybe we should, maybe we should think about the connection there. We basically use the fact classically, there's another way of thinking about detailed balance solely phrased in terms of correlation functions. That's basically the definition that we're generalizing. So I am pretty sure that even in a quantum setting, if you set that something up where there is obviously a current, you will violate any definition of quantum detailed balance. Because even at a classical level, look, there's stuff circulating, right? There is not this balancing of transitions. What I'm talking about are more subtle systems where the naive notion of detailed balance in the quantum regime doesn't hold, but this funny version with this hidden time reversal symmetry, this thermofield double state, it still holds. Okay, so we have a question from Victor Albert um, who asks, I don't think one can evolve a Lindbladian or semi-group in negative time. So how should I physically interpret the time reversal symmetry and correlations? Yeah, and so uh, good point and like a way of looking at this symmetry, this, this is the symmetry condition we're talking about. We don't ever have to really talk about negative time, right? So the question is in this doubled system, right? System B never actually evolves in time. So the way that we look at these correlation functions, right, T and minus T, it's basically which is the earlier operator, which is the later operator. So the earlier operator is always at zero. The later operator is always at some positive time t. And this is also even a feature in these early 1970s definitions of detailed balance. They always end up involving correlation functions that are time ordered.
but there's still a symmetry to check because again, either the X could be later or the Y could be later. But that's a good point. We don't have to somehow, you know, invoke negative times with sort of, uh, you know, Lindblad master equations, right? It's just what quantity do you measure second and what do you measure first? That's the symmetry that we're looking at. Great, okay. It looks like there's a follow-up question on that, but I'm actually going to suggest that that follow-up question be asked in the discussion with you afterwards because- Cool, okay, that. yeah. So, so let me um, actually move on to a question by Zhue Yue Zhang, who asks, could you talk more about this hidden time reversal symmetry in, Bo in the Bose-Hubbard model? Yeah, okay, so, um, so this is definitely work that's in uh, progress. And again, we're always thinking about baby steps here. And I know for, you know, if your bread and butter is really always thinking about things in the many body limit, you know, what is this guy talking about, right? Single modes, weird things happening. I've always taken the point of view that weird things can happen in single mode systems. If you understand them well, that gives you a good vantage point for looking at things more in the many body limit. So when I talked about the Bose Hubbard uh, type model, Okay, I drew this cartoon that was sort of misleading. We know about how to think about this symmetry in a single nonlinear cavity. What we have done to date is basically look at how that manifests itself in a pair of modes, right? So now I have two bosonic modes, each maybe with nonlinearity, each with drives, each with dissipation, and also with a variety of couplings, right? So I could have linear couplings where photons hop from one to the other. I could have nonlinear couplings, um, a cross pair type interaction. I could have non-degenerate parametric amplifier or two mode squeezing type terms. And so what we've started to understand, if you write down that full space of two mode models with up to quartic nonlinearities, when do you have this symmetry? Okay, and it's still sort of work in progress. I don't wanna say anything uh, you know, too definite right now. The one definite thing we can say is there are non-trivial models of two nonlinear coupled uh, bosonic modes that we can solve in this way that has this hidden time reversal symmetry. And we hope that if we know how to do it with two, right, if we know how to glue two of these things together and preserve the symmetry, maybe that lets us glue n of them together. My students hate it when I say that, but you have to be an optimist. So, you know, that's our, our working assumption right now. Great. So with that, um, I, there are perhaps a couple more questions, but what I'm going to do is encourage um, everybody to join the um, post-seminar discussion with Ash. There is already a link um, in the chat, but before you go there, let me take a moment to advertise uh, talks that are coming up next week. So I will share this here. Um, so next week, we have um, the uh, uh, our virtual AMO seminar will be given by Rob Sholkoff um, from Yale. He'll be talking about hardware efficient quantum error correction. And um, in addition, on Thursday of next week, uh, the quantum science seminar uh, will feature Charles Adams from Durham University. He will be talking about hybrid quantum interfaces using um, Rydberg collective encoding. Um, and I will just briefly mention about the upcoming VAMOS seminar. Some of you who are aficionados of both of these seminars may have heard Rob Sholkoff's talk this week in the quantum science seminar. Um, so rest assured that he will be giving a complimentary talk next week at VAMOS. Um, so uh, uh, you will get even more if you listen to both. So um, with that, I will just um, thank Ash one more time. Um, thank you. And I encourage you all to click that link in the chat and head over to the post-seminar discussion. Right. You even encourage me? Even you. I think you even had an unanswered question. So yes. that is the chance to ask it. <laughs>